Black Celebration. I am your host, Just Niche, and I have two very special guests with me, both Prairie View A&M University alumni. I have Stisha to my right and David G to my left. Both are going to be uh, experts in the matter of adoption and foster care, which is the conversation that we are having today. Um, as you know, each episode we give a Black-owned champagne, and today it is the McBride Sisters Sparkling Brute, and we're going to pop the bottle. I leave that. I'm already poured up, but I leave to pop the bottle with my guests, so who would like to do the honors? I guess me. Okay. <laughs> turn up, you the turn up king. No, don't get nervous now. Well, yeah. Well, you know, we champagne. <laughs> So the McBride sisters, um, again, they are a black owned wine company. They have a line of red, white, and I wanted to start with them, start the season off with them because um, they are all about community. Of course, they are blood sisters, but I'm bringing my brother and my sister on the show with me. So starting out with a company that is all about family. We also have our book for the episode, which is I Am Enough by Grace Byers. She is an actress. You might Boo remember Kitty. her as, yes, Boo, Boo Kitty, Kitty from Empire. And she created a book for a little black girl. And so since the episode is about boys and girls in foster care or adoption, I wanted to um, just feature a book that children can read. So. Let go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it up. I'm going to stop because I'm too. <laughs> okay. So, I am going to let my guests introduce themselves because um, they're going to do it way better than me. <laughs> True story. So, we are going to start with David G. Um, for those that don't know, David G. is my best friend. And he's also the talent. He's let us know several yeah, times I tonight that he is the talent for the evening. Yes. So without further ado, David G. My name is David G. Daniels. I've been a G since I was born, so like never take that away from me. And I am here not just as her best friend, but from, as a for perspective, I am a former foster kid. So I spent 16 years and nine months in foster care um, throughout my childhood. So I kind of have a perspective, and you know, I have some stories and some testimonies. So that's why I'm here. I am. Um, the best friend slash former foster kid. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> I am Tisha Gray. I am on the show to share the perspective of a foster and adoptive parents. Um, I have fostered nine children and I have adopted two. So that yeah. means. Sure. And that's this is why I say expert in the field because maybe we didn't go to school to learn about foster care, right? Or, you know, we didn't expect that being in a foster care system was going to be a part of our lives. But when we go through things, we know that we are the expert in our lives, right? right? And so because, Tisha, you have fostered so many children, and now you have adopted two of the girls that you fostered. Yeah. David, you were in the foster care system for a very significant amount of your life. I feel like you all are experts in this. So I just want to have a conversation because my um, hope and wish for this show is to always educate the black community, educate those that are not in the black community so that they understand the things that we go through and how we grow through them so that we provide a better life for our children. Um, so my first question is, and you know, you guys just jump in however you want to, where do you feel like the state of the foster care system is right now? Um, I think it's I think it's definitely uh, progressed. Um, I see more benefits and resources being provided to foster youth. I see, um, and when I was in foster care, um, you had to be a certain age before you could like receive your PAL benefits and stuff like that. But they extended the age, and they also allow you to do it early on. So like when I left the system, I left at 15. So I was right before I started my PAL program to get resources when I aged out, and. Um, I didn't get those resources, so you know they pay for your college. Uh, for, as long as you go to college in the state of Texas, um, they help you with uh, your first couple months of rent. Uh, they help you with a car. There's a car program now for foster youth. So I, I think it's definitely progressed. I know that they more so now try to move, stick the youth with their family. So next of kin, so they try to they really push them for kinship instead of actually just putting them in foster care and in them getting lost in the system and stuff like that. So I advocate for them wholeheartedly. You know, I do my public speaking and I've been 
into Austin, the White House, under Obama's administration, <laughs> um, to, to basically advocate, advocate, and be the voice for the voiceless, you know, and I have a perspective, I've had experiences that I've witnessed and went through, I have foster brothers and sisters, so it, it's definitely better than when I was there, okay? And when I was there, y'all didn't work, but no, it's definitely better. So. so something you mentioned is that you have um, spoke in different places. What is your experience like with those kids that are now in the system? Uh, I'm here to make them laugh, okay? Forget about all they promised about 45 minutes to an hour, but um, I just want, I've always been this pay it forward. So I always, I tell them what I wanted somebody to tell me. I, I, I tell them about experiences. I let them know that it does get better. You get stronger. Perseverance is key. Um, foster kids, foster youth, age, daughter, and care are the strongest people in this world. I tell them that because, you know, we got thrown to the wolves and we come back leading the pack. But I, I, I provide encouragement and then I also put a little humor in it. So I'm telling my story, I make it humorous. So you know, you can laugh. I mean, I cry many nights, many days. But look at me now, you know, as a success story to them, they, they really are inspired. And it, it helps that I don't look my age or look like anything that I've been through. So when I be talking to them, right. they be like, I thought you was like our age. I was like, no, this is what, this is what perseverance looks like and, this, yeah. and, and paying it forward. So it, I, they definitely, they light up, they laugh, we crack jokes. I, I just, just encourage them. And, and let them know that their dreams matter and to have something to hold on to, whether it's um, a good teacher, a good foster parent, or faith, all those things. If you find you some good in your life and you hold on to it because you know it does get better. Right. So, <clears throat> I mean, just providing them with that hope, I feel like, Cisha, that's what your family is doing. So, I'm gonna also give a little background about Cisha. Cisha, how many siblings do you have, biological siblings? I have eight siblings. So she already comes from a big family. Right. How many biological children do you have? Three. Three children has adopted two. So you have a family of seven now because you, your husband, mm-hmm. you have two adopted daughters and your three sons. But we have a family of eight as of today. Right. Because, because you we have, have we have a baby. We just took, um, accepted a baby into our home a week ago. Okay. So now we are a family of eight until she is prayerfully reunified with her family. Okay. So providing that hope to kids that David does when he's talking, when they're in your home, what do you feel like the foster care system is doing for them right now? For now, it's, well, I can only speak for the kids that come into my home. I I know everybody's situation is different, but um, I'm on top of my kids' foster uh, social workers. I'm on top of them. I'm making sure that they are present, that they're checking in on them, that they know exactly what they need. the oldest child we've had was six years old. She turned six while she was in our home. And um, she had been with her mom for, you know, uh, until she came into my home. So she needs something a little bit more than a, a newborn baby will need necessarily from her mom. So I made sure that we were advocating for her to be able to see her mom as much as possible. Um, just checking in on it, you know, instead of the once a month where they usually just pop in yeah. and see how the kids are doing. Hey, you know, baby girl is at school and she's doing well. Why don't y'all check in on her at school? Right. So let's talk about that. You said the once a month when they check in, right? Mm-hmm. Is that is that the normal check in for the case manager or a social worker who's working with them? Like, was that your experience also? It's like a one time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it just it's a lot that goes into that. Um, first off, case workers case loads are just un- unmanageable at times, but they need. Some these kids need somebody, so you know your caseload is your caseload. Um, my 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 caseworker, I've had a couple, and I've had some good ones, and I've had some, you know, not so good ones. But um, if they know, for the most part, if you're in a good home, they don't check in like that. Um, if they know you, if you're not a behavior problem, like I wasn't a bad kid, so mm-hmm. I got one of the mild ones, so you didn't. I don't have to worry about him. But the one that get kicked out of school every day, the one that the foster parents is having to, you know, write them up or you know look for them, they're doing all this other extra stuff. Those are the ones that they have to check in on more than once a month. But for me, people like me, that wasn't bad. So they were like, oh, he's good. You know, and certain times, I didn't, I didn't, I did go weeks without hearing from my house. I didn't have to track them down for like, where's my family visit? You know, yeah. you know, yeah. or where's my voucher? You know, I don't need some clothes and some shoes. But um, I, listen, I was one of those kids. I was on my case where it was like, she should have for her first. I was a kid. I, I knew they dumped about hard. I called them every day. Um, <laughs> still waiting on your return. I called from last week. It's never hurt from you. I had one caseworker to sign up. They had one caseworker to tell my foster parents to come. They don't call me. 
Like, I call, like, where's my family visit? Like, I ain't heard from you on my voucher. I need to go to the doctor. Where's my checkup? You know, my tube hurt. You know, sometimes we have those foster parents who work on top of their foster kids who are just like, you know, yeah, this is temporary, so. So what is the role of the foster case manager or social worker? Like, are they supposed to be there like that? Or to my understanding, they are. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter how small or how large their caseload is, they're supposed to get the job done yeah. for everybody on their caseload. Home visits. They home. skip out on home visits yeah. sometimes. You know, What's they, a home visit? Home visits when they come and check out, make sure you're good, see you physically, yeah, okay. you know, talk to the foster parents, see you what um, issues they're having with you, whether it be learning or behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember sometimes my parents would do a drive-by. I don't even think they got out the car. They, <laughs> Baby! Put David on the porch, <laughs> you know. But um, they, what I tell the foster kids that I speak to and what I, have, what I learned early on in my life, and that's why, you know, we have so many of these abandonment and trust issues, everyone in your life, once you enter the system, is paid to be there. Your foster parents are paid to be there. That that is a factor. Most people don't want to discuss that, but that is a factor. You're paid to be there. Your caseworkers are paid to be there. The teachers are paid to be there. You know, and sometimes foster parents have caregivers and people that come in. Everyone's paid to be there. So sometimes you look at it like, who's there for me? Like, who yeah. wants to see me succeed? Mm -hmm. Where's the veteran? When you see, you know, your foster parents are getting money for you, and they don't want to treat you like they're supposed to treat you. You think, okay, it's a money thing. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So uh, they are supposed to be there in a different capacity, but sometimes. It's, I mean, I don't know what all the excuses can be, but I just know that everyone in my life when I was a foster care was paid to be there. Mm. That's an interesting take. Do you feel like, Cisha, the case manager, do you always work with the same case manager? No. Every every single child that we've had has had a different case manager. Okay. So, and sometimes we have the uh, length of their case, the case managers change. So we've gone through case managers like over and over and over again, and several different uh, CPS workers. So do you feel like they take that type of outlook on the kids that they're working with? Like, I'm paid to do this, so I'm going to do what I'm paid to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, honestly, I feel, I know that there are case workers who do that. So it is yeah. it's just what it is. Yeah. Um, I've only come into contact with one case worker regarding my kid, you mm -hmm. know, um, that I feel like she just, I'm paid to be here, so I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Right. Other than that, all of my girls' caseworkers have gone above and beyond. Okay. You know, uh, like literally, I suggested, hey, I, from what I understand, you don't have to come to the house every month. You can meet with um, this child in the community, right. and such and such. And that's when I suggest, why don't you go pick up at school? Why don't you go talk to their teachers? Why don't you go have yeah. lunch with them? Pick them up from school. Go take them to lunch. Go, you know, she loves Chuck E. Cheese. Go take them to Chuck. You know, do this right. and the other um, every couple of months instead yeah. of just coming to the house because. It um, it's especially for my five year old, room. you know, it made her feel like her case was cared. Mm -hmm. You know, she was excited about that. She came home the first time we had her go out into the community with um our five year old. She came home and was like, Miss Don, I took me to Chuck Cheese, mm -hmm. and I had one some of them with nail polish and she put them on. You know, by the time she made them home, she had three of them. Right, she took them off, but her face lit up. Right. You know, and my whole thing is. I just want to try to figure out how we can be a part of the solution. And I think it's your role to also try to figure out how you can be a part of the solution for her too. Right. You know, and doing the bare minimum isn't going to cut it with me if I'm in foster mom. Right. Find somebody else right. who will so, allow you to do that. I love the fact that you take so much like responsibility and care for the kids that are in your home. Because something sidebar that you said to me before is that if I treat my kids this way, I'm gonna do the same for the other kids. Right. And like you said, kids need to feel like people in their lives care, not just that like, oh, they're just paid to be here. And, cause that affects you. Right. Yeah. Did that, do you feel like that affected you as a child? Like, oh yeah, I, 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 yeah, you just hit pay for so no matter what I do, you still gonna come here, so I'm gonna cuss, I'm gonna fight. <laughs> You know, I'm being rude. Um, but no, it does like so it just build it just builds on your already um abandonment issues and trust issues because you know when the, if the money runs out, you know, what's gonna happen. Like for me, I was a low level kid, so I kinda feel like sometimes I wasn't bringing in um enough money as in my foster brother who is spitting on folks and biting people, so he's a level five, you know, and I'm a level two. So it is I, I can't I don't know what the numbers are now, but like 
if I'm a level two, level one, I'm bringing in like six, seven hundred dollars. But if I'm level five, it takes a lot of energy and strength, and like you got to keep them going to the school, you got to go take them to the doctor, get them medicated, all this stuff. But they bring about twelve hundred and thirteen hundred, you know. And my little old, so I'm like, ooh, they gonna put me out. Let me do something. Let me pick somebody, you know. Let me bite somebody. No, but no, it does play into that into that trust issues and like ooh, definitely. So that from there, I learned to lean on my teachers. Like I know. Like, I had some special teachers that really cared. And I, all my foster parents weren't bad. I had some foster parents that had the same um, model as Cisha is that I'm not going to, if you, if like, you bring, I bring you in my house, I'm going to treat you as I would treat my kids. So mm-hmm. my foster parents, they never let us look. We didn't look like foster kids. We weren't allowed to act like, and I know it's like, what is act like? You know, but just like, like, you know, like acting out in public and thinking that you're not going to be disciplined. Or, you know, carrying the stereotype that I'm a foster kid, so pe- people expect me to act up, yeah. people expect me to, you know, look all wrinkled and mitch matchy and stuff like that. My foster parents like, no, make sure we brush our teeth, comb the hair. When they took family trips, we took family yeah. trips. When they got our RV, they didn't leave us, because there's some foster parents that will leave the foster kids with the um, places. Rest for, yeah, rest, yeah. Rest, rest, rest care. And then, like us, mm, we going in the RV too, you know, we taking a family trip too. So they really did, like, it's no. I'm gonna stop and get my kids signed and take you home, and you're gonna eat the hamburger help I'm making. Because there are foster parents who have done that, but it was not like that with uh, a couple of my foster parents because I've had a couple over the years. Okay. So I wanna switch gears and kind of give like history to why you all, what happened with you, or what, you know, what you're willing to share, and then why you decided to become a foster parent and now adopt a dad. So um, I'll just give a little bit of my history. I've, worked with students because i work in school so i've worked with students and children that are in foster care Um, my experience has not always been you know peaches and cream i've seen some kids in foster homes where you know i feel like the foster parents doing the bare minimum right like they don't want to bring them to appointments i'm a therapist so they don't want to bring them to the appointments or they'll say well i'm waiting on a case manager to do x y and z From my perspective as a therapist, I'm looking at it like these kids are already removed from their family, right? They need each one of us to show up and be there for them and show that we care, right? But then also be there to do what we're supposed to do. So if you're supposed to get them to that appointment to see me so that I can render the therapeutic services, do that, right? And so what I, I guess my interest in this is like, how do we get to this point? How do people get picked to be foster parents? What happens to my kids to have to be out of their home? Because it's not always just as simple as um, it was a CPS case and they were getting, you know, beat, you know? So let's talk about that. Like, David, how did you get into foster care? And then, or Cisha, you know, how did you decide to be a foster parent? Let's start with how. Well, I had, growing up, I had a, what I'm calling a summer best friend. Mm -hmm. And we, only got to hang out over the summer, you know, at the Boys and Girls Club. And the third summer that I saw her, her name was Erica, or is Erica. I don't, I don't know what Erica is, where she is, or anything about her now. But her name is Erica, and um, we used to attend the Turkey Boys and Girls Club in Highland Hill. <laughs> and the last summer that we were together, on the last day of the program, um, everybody was hugging it up. This, that, and the other, and she ended up telling me and my brother and sister, Oh, I won't be back next summer. So, real quick, we're like, Well, wait a minute, where are you going? And she said, Uh, I'm moving. And I was like, Oh, we moved from summer. My mom was saying we can come back right next summer, so you can still come back. And right when we were, I thought we were going to continue to talk about it, the um, center director called her name and was like, How do you know? So she shot out, you know, like her ride was here. And she turned around and she yelled, I'm in foster care. Mm. I had no clue what it was. Um, I was 10, maybe 11, maybe 11. And I went home, me and my brothers and sisters went home, and we asked our parents to tell us about foster care. And they were just like, what do you want to about foster care for? <laughs> but they told us right. what we could understand at mm-hmm. 10, 9, and 8 years old. Mm-hmm. And because then it was just, Four of us, and then I'm a twin, so like, those are our ages. And um, after they shared that with us, I said, "Well, can y'all foster her? Can y'all see y'all can foster Erica?" And so my mom contacted the center director, who put her in contact with Erica's caseworker, 
and they had her on for dinner like a few days later. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, kids don't sit at the table with grown folks. So we would sit right. out to the back while they had their conversation. And when it was, they were done about an hour and a half, two hours later, our parents called us out and um, asked us how come we didn't feel embarrassed to have two. Mm-hmm. And um, we were like, okay, you know. And uh, my mom said, yes, you know, she had two brothers and she named their brothers, her brothers. And we knew who her they brothers were, but we didn't know they were her brothers. And, you know, back then in the 90s, maybe I don't know how kids think now, but back then in the 90s, we didn't really equate um, somebody who was super, super light skin or mixed race with somebody as dark as me mm-hmm. or darker than me as siblings. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. And she was a mixed race. Her brothers were Kenyan. Really, really dark, smooth, beautiful skin, but we just didn't put them together. Right. You know what I'm saying? And um, turns out one of her parents was Kenyan, the other one wasn't. And she was leaving to go to a home that would accept her and all her siblings together. Oh, so wow. Right now they were right. separated. Mm-hmm. Um, however, we would have been considered picked of kinship mm-hmm. because we knew her. We got to know her over the last couple of years. So if my parents had space to take her siblings and were willing to take her siblings, they would have been able to. But we didn't have the space. Okay. You know, we just right. didn't have space to add three kids. And um, so she left. And I never seen again. And I told my mama and my daddy, um, when I be grown, I want to be a foster mom and figure out how I can keep some siblings together. You know. Wow. And that was 21 years ago. Right. right. You know. <laughs> so, and then once I, um, my husband, once Kermit said he wanted to marry me, I reminded him because I believe all my friends, for the most part, knew that I wanted to at least adopt. Right. You know what I'm saying? And he was my friend. So I reminded him, I'm only going to marry you if you're down for the cause. Right. You know, and he said, all right, okay. Okay. That's, right. Yeah, that's amazing because let me tell you something. <laughs> to be married and y'all had three boys back to back. Mm-hmm. And for a man, it, nothing against men, but you know, just for a man <laughs> to say, I am still going to honor what I told you before and allow additional kids to come in our home, you know, and all that. That's I just think it's beautiful. I I love your family. Um, and I think it's great that you guys have adopted two beautiful young ladies and I can't wait to see everybody grow up and you know, all of that. So it is. And I've known Cisha for a very long time. So to see Cisha, you know, used to jig. (laughs) <laughs> try, we would try. Try, try to do okay? I don't know, I don't see the whole time. I don't really dance like that. Like, yeah, I can't do yeah. it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, you know, to be at the party that he did and now see you to be, you know, the mom and wife that you are, it's like, you know, it's yeah. beautiful. So I love to see black families thrive and then just the fact that y'all are bringing additional kids in the home. I think it's beautiful. Um, David also has a large family. David is the youngest of five. Of five. Kids, but I also have an older brother outside of my immediate family. Right. So you have two brothers and three sisters. Yes. And then David is the youngest. So yes. you tell us your backstory. So um, being the youngest, you know, you get left. <laughs> you know what I mean? You get left. No, but um, so um, my family, my parents had um, some substance abuse issues. Uh, and, uh, my father, he was, a little, uh, he was abusive. Um, and so, therefore, um, some events happened one day, and I ran away. I'm a runner, and I just thought my life was in danger. And so, um, I ran away, and the person, the police, I just caught a cab. I never forget it was like eleven dollar cab. The man thought I had money. I was like, "Take me to the police station." No, I had no money. I ain't got no shoes on my feet. I said, uh, "Take me to the police station." So he dropped me out of there. He's like, "Eleven dollars." I said, "Sir, I'm, I'm battered. I'm, I'm beat. I'm, I'm trying to get you know help. Eleven dollars, whatever." So the police sent me home, they thought I was a troubled child. And so I got, you know, some abuse. Um, and I went to school the next day and they came and examined me and they took me. And so that started my journey into the system. Um, How old were you? Uh, I was 11, okay. 10 or 11. And so from there, it just, it started my journey in the system, which sometimes they're like, I just stay at home. You know, if I'm gonna be abused, I just go with the one I know, you know what I mean? Be strangers and him mistreating me. Um, but that's what started my journey there. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted my mom to be able to be safe and get, you know, get whatever help she needs. Because, you know, having a kid kind of slows you down. You know, you don't want to completely 
abandon all that you know or, or like run because you got a child that you're responsible for. You don't have your child, you know, on the streets or, you know, struggling with you. So that was another issue why I was like, okay, I'm going to just run away from my mom and get her life together so she don't have to worry about my son, you know, I'm good in, I'm going to take care of me. Or so I thought. And so that's what started my journey into foster care. You know, like, like still there. Like, you know. So you said that you were like mistreated in foster care. Yeah. I've seen some of that. Um, obviously, I'm a mandated reporter, so I report that as well, okay? <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> I'm a snitch, okay? Unfortunately. But fortunately, because sometimes, you know, like, we have to protect kids, right? And that is always my role. Any child in my life, whether that's my job and or kids that are just around me, I'm going to protect children. Right. So I do tell on folks. Mm-hmm. Um, but with that, I've seen no. it. <laughs> I've seen it not even be so avert like you know they're not beating kids in front of me right but the way they talk to yeah, kids you know, or just that emotional neglect yeah. like this child can tell that you don't really want like, them yeah. you know and sometimes the kids do have behavior problems right yeah. why would you not right i was taken away from my home let's just say six years old you know when i was at the home i had parents that were either there or not there i had a b- older sibling that was molesting me i'm making up a scenario but I'm just saying, you go through all of that and you expect the child not to have any type right. of behavior issues. Yeah. So when you open your home to somebody, to me, it's like you're opening your home to all of the baggage that they bring as well. And you have the option to, not to cut you off, but you no, have yeah. the option to say what kids you want and what kids you don't want. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll tell you the background of the child, they'll tell you what they're coming from, how long they were in care, what are their symptoms, I mean, not symptoms, but what are their issues, because it's all documented. Your whole life is documented from the time. You step into CPS until you're dead. I still got a file out there, but they um they tell you so you can say mm, I'm not, I'm not. like if you have a house and you got like two kids in the house and then they call you this kid needs someone to stay. Okay, well give me the background of the kid. Uh, they may not have Julie. Da, da, da. I can't accept that kid. That kid is going to disturb what I already have with these two kids. Mm-hmm. If I have a system or a schedule, you know, because sometimes that is the case. You bring in a kid and then the good kids start doing what the bad kids doing. And, they seeing how you have to deal with them, and this is a lot of moving parts when dealing with this foster care system. So, so, but you do have the option. So, I, I, I always didn't understand why foster parents would take kids that they didn't want. Like, if you know that the kid bad, because there's cases where I've witnessed foster parents taking kids and then giving them back, or even adopting. Like, that was a big issue. Like the last couple of years, folks would adopt kids and then give them back. Wait a minute, you can give adopted children back? I thought. That's like that's yours. Once you did that's the that's, that's the rule. That's, that's what they yeah, that's right. They do second chance adoption. Wow, that's what, that's what they call them. You know, second chance adoption. Now that that's a funeral for me. That's that's a death. Like you, yeah. you, you told me that you was going to be your forever kid, yeah. and, that's just like, and now you see I got a little angry issue or you know some mm-hmm. some problems, and you giving me back. Like that's that's all right. That's stuff. I've never had to go through. So when you were having like the issues with the foster parents or maybe even other foster kids in the foster home, how did you advocate for yourself? Like what was your process and how did you So I've always so that? I'm an old soul. So like I, I've always been the responsible one. Like I, I when I was uh, when I was before I went to foster care, I literally just in time I had to take care of myself. So when I went to the system, it was like I really don't need y'all. I just need y'all to provide me a, a room and board. I'm gonna just go ahead and do my thing at eleven. Um, but I've always been very vocal about um, treat. The reason I'm here is because I want to be treated better. The reason I'm here is because I want to feel safe. The reason why I'm here is I need three meals a day and a bath, you know. Um, so I was like self-sufficient in that aspect. But when the abuse happens or the neglect, like, you're supposed to be able to tell your caseworker. But sometimes the caseworkers be so like, okay, that's minor, you know, oh, they talk about me stupid. They, 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 they get downplayed because they want you to have somewhere to stay. And the uh, shelters are overcrowded, you know, there's a shortage of foster parents. So some of the things that you complain about them too, they'd be like, well, you know, just, just you know, just, it's not like keep your head down, you know, hopefully we can get you back with your parents or I'm going to work on finding you somewhere else to go and then months pass and you're still, but then you just get to this point where I've just accepted that this is what it's going to be. Um, mm-hmm. With your foster brothers and, and, you know, same thing with foster brothers and sisters, you can, you tell you tell people and you tell the adults, but again, sometimes the things, they, they don't respond, they don't act on them, and sometimes they do, um, but your caseworkers are sometimes they be in cahoots with the parents. You know what I'm saying? You know he's lying. And admittedly, oh, he's lying. The foster parents will lie. You know it's their word against yours. Yeah. So the foster parents will sometimes embellish and lie, and the caseworker will go with what they're saying. You know you mm-hmm. literally have to have um, proof or something. Like I know one time, 
this lady, she didn't even have her license. Uh, it was her certificate was in the mail, but I had to be placed in her home. And she was, excuse my French, batshit crazy. Like the lady would choke me, you know what I'm saying? She would she wouldn't let me call my other foster mom and talk to them because she only telling them what was happening. So one day, and I know my caseworker wouldn't believe me, so one day she was choking me and like um I had my hands up and she was slapping me and she scratched me on my hand and so I was bleeding. So I rubbed it on the, you know, sheets and the covers and stuff. So when my caseworker come, I pulled out the this lady is abusing me. You know what I'm saying? And I was like 14. You know what I'm saying? And she would like literally like jump on me and like slap me and choke me and stuff like that. And I was like, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. So you were like in full survival because to have the the mindset to say, okay, she scratched me. Let me put it on the oh, sheet yeah, yeah, yeah. so that I can have proof. Like you were in full survival mode yeah, while you were. Yeah, in foster care, you could be up today living your best life and get snatched out of a foster home for whatever reason. Like I had some foster parents who wanted to turn their house into like a transitional like group home and stuff like that. And the agency was not willing to part ways with us. They wanted they was like, oh yeah, I can go with the kids have to stay with this agency. And I just thought that was so selfish because you yeah. hear we deal with these people, they are good foster parents, they're raising us right, instilling in us good values and more. And because you have been dead against the foster parents, because they were leaving the agency because they didn't allow you guys because these agencies is another story too. They didn't allow you guys to just neglect us. They didn't allow you guys to handle them any kind of way because the agency will come in and try to run the foster home. And my foster mm-hmm. parents were not that type of foster parent. They were like, "This is my house. <laughs> no, I'm gonna take care of these kids, but you're not gonna run up any like you can't just pop up at the house. You have to call. You have to set a point and stuff like that." So it was a little back and forth with them. So once my foster parents said, "We'll keep them, but we're switching agencies," and stuff, they were like, "Well, you can't take these kids," and so they're not having to go into a shelter. Then some more group homes, but you are, you are, you just don't know. You just don't know what your life would be like. And that's just the same as when I woke up on December 7, 2000, I didn't know that I was going into foster care. Mm-hmm. And then the days when I wake up and my foster parents are like, I don't want to be foster parents anymore. I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. I didn't know if I was going to get the same stability that I had in this home or having another home. So, yes, you are in full survivor mode and it, and, and, and it grows, it grows with you. So, like, I had to become an adult, and an adult, I still was in survival mode. I was, I was surviving. I was, but I, I want to thrive. You know what I'm saying? I want to live, and I was not. I was living, but I was also was always in survival mode, and that's there's no way to live, you know. So something you said about um, just growing older and wanting to thrive, Tisha, your experience has been that you all have had a lot of babies, right? Mm-hmm. Or toddlers, Toss baby, right? So with that, going on what David said, like he was 15 once he got out. Um, what do you feel like you're giving your kids when they're there as far as, you know, what they can take with them to continue to survive? Because yeah. some of them leave your home, right? You yeah. didn't adopt all of them. No, right. They all have been re- either reunified with their parents or with a relative. Mm-hmm. You know, none of them leave our home to go be adopted, not be able to mm-hmm. to be adopted by someone else that's not, that they don't know. You know what I'm saying? Or that their parents don't know. Um, so what do you feel like you're giving them? I think I'm giving them attachment. Mm-hmm. Positive attachment. Um, I'm instilling in them that they can trust somebody. Mm-hmm. I'm prayerful that when they leave my home, that attachment, that trust, worthiness is still with them along the way. Right. Um, in my opinion, I think that, if, especially at that age, they need attachment. Right. In order to be attached, you have to trust somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I know it's a, a, a big difference when you're preteen and teenager, but I think you can chime in. I think that may be the basis of it. Mm-hmm. And because we get the little one, mm-hmm. I think that's all I, you know, I know to do at this point. Right. Um, to give them that, I give them the support. I give their families the support. Mm-hmm. So my well, husband and good. I, yeah, we're not just fostering the children. We take pride in the fact that we foster the family. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. Um, all of our our, our girls, because we foster girls, all of them, we have good relationships with their parents. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we had nine foster kids. I want to say only, at this time, only one of them, their family, we don't communicate with, mm-hmm. but that was their choice. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. Some people want to just, once they get CPS mm-hmm. and the state and the man out of their life, yeah, they, they want to move on. Right. And we get right. it. We get they, it. We go. Yeah. They, they don't want anybody who can remind them. Yeah. No matter how positive or loving or caring we may be, mm-hmm. they just don't want that. 
you know, it's like, I appreciate y'all. They were able to take care of my baby. I really, really appreciate it. I appreciate you advocating for me, too, and telling these people that I'm doing more than what they can see. Right, 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 you know right. what I'm saying? Right. But is it okay with you? Yes. You know, yes. and I'm like, absolutely. Right. You know, because the truth of the matter is, I would love to to be auntie right. to all of the kids, right? but I just can't. Right. You know, and I respect that. I respect that. You know, this mom and daddy feel like they got enough on TV. You right. know what I'm right. saying? Right. Um, it so might be a chapter that just feel like I want to call the chapter. I've yep. done what I needed to do. My child is back with me, and so mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. But I love what you said about you fostering the family. Yeah. Right. I think that you give a sense of belonging when these kids are in your home. Um, because I mean, you post on your social network, um, not the kids, but just, you know, interacting with them and stuff like that. And it feels like, I mean, I'm just watching through the phone and it feels like a big family, you know, yeah. like y'all are just one big happy family. Everybody is together. Yeah. The boys, your three boys are like engaged in mm-hmm. their lives and like everybody is we family. Yeah, it's a family. You know, um, Cruz, my five-year-old, um, when we first started fostering, I think he was three. Mm-hmm. And when I first fostered daughter, I was reunified with her mom. Uh, I think he took it the hardest. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was a year older than him, but she was younger than our oldest son, Colin. And Cruz took it the hardest. He was crying for I don't know how long. Like, mm-hmm. when is she coming back? And she she usually leaves and comes back, like when she had visits with her mom mm-hmm. and stuff. What? She hasn't come back yet, and um, we had to explain to him that the little girl that we called y'all sister for six months, he didn't understand. Like, right. is she my sister? Why she not here? Right. So when he asked me that, I really didn't know what to say because she was our first child. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I was just like, oh my gosh. Colin jumped in at six years old. Mm-hmm. Colin, oh, five years old. Colin jumped in, and he explained to Cruz, who was three at the time, that... All of our sisters that we, the one who just left and the one that we're going to get, they're more like sister cousins. Mm-hmm. Cousins gotta go home eventually. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm right. saying? But we still treat them like sisters. Right. And since then we've had eight other girls or seven other girls go home. Right. And he he knows that. He's like, all right, sister cousin, yeah. you know. Maybe we'll see you again. It was you know, fun. It was fun. Right. Yeah. yeah. And for the most part, we try to get them together. We okay. try to, if, if, the, if their mom or aunt or um, grandma reach out to us, like, hey, can we all get together? Right. You know, the kids, our kids, they all look forward to it. So we still do our thing. We still try to show up for uh, special moments for them, school shows, school plays, birthdays, Christmases. I just did a Christmas thing, yeah. you know, not too long ago uh, in December. So, um, I think that that's that's pretty much you know yeah the, the basic you're giving a lot giving love mm-hmm. is enough yes. but everything else that you're giving I feel like it's amazing so yeah I want to ask um because y'all know this is the black celebration mm-hmm. so we have to we talk about black. the black child yeah. in foster care mm-hmm. and the black families that have to go through this system and this process um what do y'all feel like? is getting our kids in these scenarios. Like what is taking our kids from their family into a foster home? Um, I would say for me, for, for what I've experienced and what I know, is that you have kids and they're not really ready to be parents. That's number mm-hmm. one. Um, and then resources. Um, yeah. I've watched foster kids come to the system for the slightest things. It wasn't detrimental in my situation. Like, you know, I just felt like my life was out of control, you know, at, at seven. I just couldn't see no way out. Um, but for some kids, it's the loss of a parent. Your mm-hmm. parent dies and they don't have anyone to go to. Parents get incarcerated. You know, and when I say pass away, like they have terminal illnesses, but they can also die in a car accident. And those kids have came into the system as well. It's not mm-hmm. always abuse. It's not always neglect. It's not always drugs. Yeah. So that is important. Yes. I, want, I want to shed light to that. I think that, okay, a part of the show is that we also mitigate things, right? And so a part of what America has made it seem like is that all black people do is abuse their kids, beat them, and then that's why they go into foster care. Not true. But what you just said is obviously it's also very true to our story. It also to be, it's also resources. There are also kids who have issues 
that parents are not willing to address or get them the appropriate help that they need. And so from there, it goes to the school system, and the yeah. school system calls CPS. And then, you know, like truancy, I've watched people come into foster care because they just was skipping school, and the parents like, well, what y'all want me to do? And the CPS was like, well, we're going to take them. And the parents were like, well, take them, because they don't go to school with y'all either. You know, I can't. What you want me to do? You get to a certain age. You're not going to be, you know, whooping your child uh, that's 16 instead of 62 mm-hmm. or whatever the case may be. So I think it's for me, it's just uh, looking at it, it's the resources. It's also the understanding that every foster kid that comes into the care is not on the scale of uh, life or death. You yeah. know, it's a, they just didn't have, they, they come from a big family, you know. Or it's also too, if you want to get real deep with it, I don't go too deep, but also there are people having kids that are from rape victims, you yeah. know what I'm saying? You don't want to keep a child that so that this man raped you and now you cured the child, but now you're going to give the child up because it's a reminder of the that experience natural, and that yeah. trauma. So, I mean, it's a lot of reasons why they come in, and, and, and people need to understand it's not just black kids running all over through foster care yeah. and CPS. It is Mexican Americans, you know, it's Latinos, white like kids, kids, Caucasian kids, whatever you want. It's a lot. It's overrun. The system is overrun with you. Okay, but the black kid is the the token, and it's the it's yeah. the it's the poster child. The poster for child, child for for yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and you know, only three percent in the state of Texas go to college. That's not even graduating. That goes to college. So I represent three percent, and I'm like, I've been well out of college. You know, it's <laughs> quite the time now. <laughs> but just, right, but I, I represent that three percent. It's the, the it's either when you leave foster care. And, and that's why I, when I started advocating, I advocated for the focus of aging out. Because you get foster parents like Cisha, and you're good for the most part, but it's what you do. I have to learn this. It's what happens to you after care. It's, yeah. the, it's all of these things that go on inside of you after care. And then you age out, and you don't have anywhere to go, and you experience homelessness. So after being in foster care, then the real world comes. And you sometimes are not provided with the tools needed to succeed in the real world so you're still back dragging that foster life with you so you know they it leads to incarceration or homelessness a lot of my foster brothers and some of them on my social media but i literally tried to track them down and find them and i literally was googling one of my foster brothers i don't remember his name and a, an article came up he got shot and killed in a park in houston mm-hmm. i have a foster brother who died of cancer you know what i'm saying and like i have other foster brothers who uh, i try to you know encourage them or whatever but they they're they're stuck job to job put them in a post so it's because of the trauma, it's because of the, the abandonment issues, it's because of the triggers that, you know, like that. I remember simple things like a flat tire would make me just think my world was over. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember that in college. I had a flat tire, and it's for a foster kid. When life ha- when small things happen to you, it's not a small thing. It is a big thing. Not being able to get my tire fixed was just the end of the world for me. And it just trickle down to a bunch of other things, you know what I'm saying? So little things like that would just take me just like, oh, it's over, you know, whatever like that. So, yeah, it's a lot of things, and there's a lot of resources out there that people really don't have to what it takes to be a parent. And so sometimes those kids end up in the system, but sometimes they just come from a small family. They don't have anyone to look after them. Yeah, so. I want to piggyback on the resources, because I, I really, really believe that if um, family, well, that I think you can hold on to that thought. Can you just... See what we're doing here? It looks like it's running, running. How many minutes? Uh, is it? it said three minutes. I thought it, it looked like it was running, running. It does, like. But it says three minutes and 41 seconds. Zoom in and zoom out. Jesus Christ. Is the red light just kept blinking? It's at four minutes now. He's just, he's going to have to edit it again. He'll have, it'll be in the clues. This is bad. Okay, so piggyback off of um, I want to piggyback off of what David was saying about resources because I truly feel that if the department, which is, like, I don't know if they call CPS the department back then, right. but I feel that if the department and the state provided families with the resources that they provide foster care, mm-hmm. mm, yeah, that would be something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, wow. That's my thing. And I, I also think that a lot of our people may not even know to ask for those resources. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, 
But after getting into this world and the different groups that I've joined, like on uh, Facebook and Instagram and all of these different entities that, that have been created, I've learned or I've learned that a lot of our white counterparts are sharing with white parents whose kids are in care mm -hmm. those resources yeah. to or informing them, not giving away their resources, yeah. right. but or informing them, go ask for this, go do that, right. go do this. And I just it really pisses me off that it's just not already a thing. Right. You know what I'm saying? If if re if family reunification is the primary goal of foster care, why not just let them know these are what this is what we can do in order to help your family. Right. right. You know what I'm saying? Um, but instead they post a little black boy or a little black girl on the front and say this is the face of foster care when the truth of the matter is the large majority of foster kids are white kids. Mm. You know, I think they're at 40 something percent and black kids are at 20 something percent. Um, the difference is white kids leave foster care a lot faster than black kids. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They either adopted or reunified at a faster rate. But um, I think that that is something that we need to try to find a solution for. Right. Yeah. So I hear that from both of you is that resources is the thing. Do you feel like as an advocate now for foster care system and then also you as the foster care parent, do you feel like, and for me as well, do you feel like we should be putting pressure on these agencies to help the black kids the way they do other families? Or do you feel like it is the role of the foster care parent? I think it's both. Yeah. I think it's both and I think we have to have the, the role of the state because the agencies can only do what the state gives them. Oh, I mean, you know when I said saying? agency, I was thinking about the department. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. So I think the law and the rules and all of that needs to just completely be dismantled right. and rewritten. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um. And then we can just go from there, right? Once you dismantle this this organization and the way you set it up to uh, like most of the laws that have been created, right. you know, we suffer right. right. basically. Um, once it's dismantled and then rebuilt appropriately, and add, everybody is supplied what they need, you know, at an adequate uh, adequately, then maybe we could just make a little bit of difference, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's state. Local and state, yeah. and state level as well. I think it's the it's the it's the laws that you know stop you from doing all that you can do, but also I think that the agencies don't fight enough yeah. to change those laws. Um, it's left in the laps of former foster kids who've mm -hmm. been through it, and, and have to, that's why I use my voice because I'm not. To some, I'm a success story, but to me, I'm not as successful as I wish and would hope to be, or that I you aspire will. to be one yeah. day. But it takes them seeing people like me and hearing it from me to be like, okay, well, we, we need to do something. You know, because most foster kids, when they get out, they don't want to have nothing to do with foster kids. They don't want to advocate. They don't want to, they don't want to remember none of this yeah. stuff. And so for me, I'm just paying it forward because there is somebody, some foster youth, some foster parents, some caseworker that is in the midst of what I've been, coming out of what I've come out of or going through. And, you know, and, and it's very important for foster parents and caseworkers to hear of the experiences of having foster kids in their home and knowing what my experience was so that you could be a better foster parent yeah. and you could be a better caseworker and know that your efforts and your energy and your time and your, your resources, your finances is not in vain because if I didn't have those good foster parents in mixed in with those bad foster parents and those good experiences mixed in with them, I don't know where I would be. You know what I'm saying? I always knew I was going to be okay, but how okay was I going to be? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. to the point that I am now. So. I think it's also, it, we need to continue to give voice, 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 mm -hmm. voice to this cause, to this issue, and also allow foster parents to, because uh, I know when I was in foster care, it was a big thing, like the agency just wanted to run everything, you know, they mm -hmm. just wanted to tell you how to do this, how to, it's not a robot, okay, it don't work that way, this kid mm -hmm. needs this, this kid needs that, these, these foster parents are living with these young people, so they know, yep. versus you coming in once a month, mm -hmm. And you seeing on paper what they did activity wise and stuff like that. No, at least foster parents have brain to, to to sometimes the foster parents get bogged down and don't want to do as much as they can because the agency won't allow them to. You know, they want to run in and out the house, tell you how to do this, tell you how to raise these kids and stuff like that. And no, I decided to be a foster parent because I have a little experience. Or if I if, if I don't have experience, what you're trying to teach me is not to help me with this particular 
foster kid, you know, everyone has different needs. We all come in with different needs, different emotional trauma, different triggers. So, yeah, resources. Well, what I'm hearing is that dismantle a system, which we already know in this country, the whole system needs to be dismantled. It is all a mess. Um, but I'm also understanding that we do have power in some way. And that as an advocate, a social worker, a foster parent, that we there are areas where we can put pressure. Now that I, I mean, having this conversation with you all has enlightened me. So the students I work with, I know now what foster parent role is, right? Um, and I can apply pressure there. It's, it's my job to keep the child safe. And I'm willing to go above and beyond my, ch- my job, my role, to make sure that these kids get what they need to do. Right. My whole purpose of working with children is simply because I do feel like if kids are given the tools younger to be successful, they will not have as much as uh, a hard time as an adult as some of us have had. You know, like we've had to learn from things yeah. that we grew up with and didn't have anybody to talk to about or, you know, just different traumas that we went through. So my like sole purpose is to at least help children to overcome some of the things that they're going through while they're going through. So if that means I need to put more pressure on CPS or, you know, I don't have a problem sending any type of uh, email or making whatever type of phone calls I need to to advocate for my kid. So I appreciate y'all giving me this knowledge because now I know how to move forward in my role. Um, and it's a planting of seed, um, and everyone mm-hmm. has their part in the garden, kind of the garden. And so um, there was a foster parent that came along and planted the seed of always carry yourself with pride, you know, never let them see you sweat. And so then I went to school, and there was a teacher who, you know, watered that seed. And then mm-hmm. I went, I went to church, and there was a church member. That was the son for that seed. And so everybody has a role in the garden. And so because I met you at 11, that doesn't mean that at 13 and 14, I'm not still growing and flourishing from that seed that you planted years ago. And so that's why it's so good for people to plant and to, and it's in life in general, but we're talking about foster youth. It's important to plant seeds, you know. And I didn't see this house forever, you know. Yeah. Those six months, like she said, attachment and trust, that was the seed that's planted. So even though that young person might meet a couple of other bad foster parents that have some experiences with foster brothers and sisters when it comes to attachment and trust, she'll still have something to go back to a foundation that this is what healthy attachment looks yeah. like. This is what mm-hmm. trust, healthy trust looks like. And you just wasn't worthy of my trust and my right. you know attachment. So I think that that's good. That's some foster parents that have definitely planted seeds in my life. And they have definitely, I still hold those same values true, you know. Most people think like, you know, kind of quick with the comebacks and stuff. My foster parents taught me that. And one day I came home and I told her that this such and such said something about me. And she said, and what did you say back? And I said, nothing. She said, no, sir, you, you, you got to be sharp. And she taught me how to clap back. So that's why. Right. Shout out to my foster parents. I know some people hate it, but, you know, it just, it's carried me through this life. <laughs> it's been saved me a bunch of, you know, trouble and trust issues with people. So. Well, I appreciate all the knowledge that you all have brought to the table. Um, I want to say that we have educated people, we've mitigated some stereotypes, we want to celebrate. So in doing so, I want each of you to talk about where you are right now in like your journey of advocating for foster care and being a foster parent. Let's celebrate um, the way you all are still making moves and affecting our community. So. So, um, where I'm at in my advocacy now is that I simply, um, uh, people contact me to come and speak and tell my story as I have been here, but more so when I speak, I'm talking to my foster sisters and brothers, so I'm encouraging them, I'm telling them my story, making them laugh along the way, and also showing them what perseverance looks like, and I'm also talking to judges, lawyers, and caseworkers about my experience in care, what I would have wanted to see differently, and what resources would have led me a different way, different way than where I'm at in certain ways I had to go through things. And so I just continue to do my advocacy. Um, I advocate on my own show, you know, my podcast. I advocate um, and local legislature. I testify. I've testified in Austin about things that I've experienced and what I would want to see differently. So I'm here for the foster kids. You know, everybody else is cool. Y'all can listen. But I really be trying to reach the foster kids because I really want them to know that it does not get easier, you just get stronger. And I also want them to know that if you just keep being a good person, keep waking up, paying it forward, keeping the faith, like you will be fine. I am fine. I'm not the best that I should be, 
But I am good, you know, compared to what my life has been. So I don't look like anything that I've been through. Love it. Well, where I am in my advocacy is trying to bring as many families to this side. Good families, good people with good hearts, a heart for kids, a heart for the people for, um, to become foster parents. So I am connecting single folks, married folks, um, common law folks with my agency mm -hmm. so that we can get them signed up to become foster parents. I think that the easiest way for me to do that is through technology. So I um, talk about it on my social media. Never show the kids' faces. I believe they deserve a sense of privacy and their parents as well. Um, so we don't show faces unless you know we're adopted. But um, I think just putting a face with it because a lot of people don't know, you know, what it's about, and a lot of black people in particular don't want the, the man, the, the people involved in their lives. You know what I'm saying? So. My thing is, we, we primarily foster black kids, okay? We recently opened it up to uh, other children of color, but we do not foster white kids. There's no shortage of families who want white children, so be my guess. Right. In the meantime, we're trying to preserve the black familial unit. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to restore that family. You know, I'm here to love on your baby and love on you as long as you need me to, as long as however long that takes. The minimum is six months sometimes, sometimes it's 18 months, depending on right. the situation, and um, do what I can do in order to restore your family. Because our union has been torn apart since the beginning of time, right. you know, and I think there are amazing black people, young and old out, who would make really great foster parents, but they just don't know what all it entails. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, on top of the fact that Big Mama has been foster parents forever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Just, you know, that cousin that you grew up at 21 and 30. Now we don't really have no big mama, so not yeah, we ain't got big, big mama yeah. is as young as the mama. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but we've been taking care of other people's kids forever. For a long time. Um, so I think if we can get enough people, especially young people, because we just add a little bit of the bad to it. Yeah. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. Get some young people on this side to become foster parents. Foster, um, fostering in style. Yes, fostering in style, fostering the family. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, then I've done my job. I love it. I'm I'm here for all of it. This is why I had you all on. So Cisha, thank you. Mm -hmm. David, thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope that um, our listeners have gained some knowledge. I I know they have gained some knowledge. Um, if you guys want to reach out to David, he is on Instagram. It's David G Daniels. I've been a piece since I was born. So nobody can ever take that away. Okay, and Fisha. I'm on Instagram at Mama M A M A in the gray area, gray with an A. I'm on Instagram, and you can also visit my website at Mama in the gray area .com. All of that information will be in the description below so that you can follow them. Again, this has been the Black Celebration. Each month, we are bringing you a Black owned champagne. This show was sponsored by the McBride Sisters, Sparkling Brutes. Each of my guests will take home a bottle for themselves to enjoy. And Cisha, this book, I Am Enough, is also for your girls. Oh, thank you. Yes. So thank you so much again for joining us. Follow me on Instagram at justniche underscore. And thank you for listening. Bye. Peace out.